So good evening, everyone. Welcome to another online event of the Java User Group Switzerland in collaboration with our friends from the Software Crafts Romandie Meetup Group. My name is Peti Koch and I'm your host from the Java User Group Switzerland. And hello. with me today, Alvaro. Yeah, hello. My name is Alvaro and I represent the Software Craft Romandie community for tonight. And our guest is Valentina Zupac, live from Belgrade in Serbia. Welcome, Valentina. Thanks a lot. Really excited to be here. Thank you very much for coming. I see already a lot of uh, people in the chat. Welcome also in the chat. Um, I'll share some slides with some general information before we start uh, with the talk from Valentina. First of all, a big thank you for all the sponsors of the Java User Group Switzerland, the Platinum sponsor Mimacom, the five gold sponsors, and the many silver sponsors. Thank you very much. Also, thank you to the sponsors of the Software Crafts Romandie Group, Socraft and Socra Agile. Then you are all now in a big market session uh, on the top right hand side you see the chat uh, which are you already using that's excellent um I, probably we're uh, very international today and i'm interested in where are you based um maybe you can write in hello from i don't know london from zurich from Bern, wherever you are from geneva and then if you have a question please use the question and answer tab uh, to post your question. Uh, we will pick them up at the end. Uh, you have the possibility to uh, vote for questions. So the most interesting questions uh, will bubble up to the top and will be answered first. Then if you want to get in touch with the Java User Group Switzerland, feel free to use the Slack workspace. You see here the URL for it. You can uh, propose ideas for upcoming events or ask questions. Then for the Software Crafts Romandie. Yeah, the Software Craft Romandie meetup occurs twice a month. We have events in French and in English. And uh, basically, we have the dates that are already scheduled, but the topics appear uh, just before. So stay tuned and we, you will know what will come next. Then this event here will be recorded and will be published later on our YouTube channel. Um, feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel and if, and if you click the bell right next to the subscribe button, you will get a push notification as soon as the video will be available. Uh, usually we will publish uh, the video around uh, Sunday, 10 o'clock Swiss time. Then there's also um, the YouTube channel of the Software Craft Romandie group uh, with the, usually with the French uh, events. Uh, you can also subscribe there, of course, click the bell. And if you're interested in more events, um, there's the mailing list on the website of the Java User Group Switzerland, where you can enter your email address and you will get uh, emails uh, if as soon as a new event is, is announced. Um, for the Software Crafts Romandie, uh, there's the meetup page, you join the the group on meetup and then from that point on you will uh, get email uh, notifications for everything goes on in the group um, after the talk and the question and answers which will take around one hour one hour and a half uh, we will move uh, over to our wonder uh, dot me room uh, you will be automatically redirected to wonder.jog.ch. In case you're interested, uh, it's uh, 
interesting platform where you can move around and build little circles and talk to each other. Valentina will also join us. So we'll have the possibility to have a chat with Valentina or with Alvaro, or with me. Uh, feel free to join us if you are interested. And that's all from the organization side. And now I am glad to hand over to Valentina for the talk. Uh, thanks a lot. So I will now uh, share my screen. I uh, hope you can uh, see my screen. Perfect. Okay, great. Uh, so first of all, um, I'm really excited to be here today and uh, to talk about the topic of TDD and clean architecture. Now, I'm sure everyone here has already uh, heard of both of those uh, terms, but um, what will be new in this presentation is the emphasis of uh, behavior. So how does system behavior, um, how is it the essence of both uh, TDD and clean architecture? Uh, firstly, a short intro regarding me. Uh, I work as a coach for software development teams. So I, my, the focus of my coaching is uh, TDD and clean architecture because with both of those, you know, we can increase quality of uh, development teams and accelerate the delivery and basically um, scale teams. Also, uh, you probably noticed that uh, I write regular posts on LinkedIn, again, about those two uh, topics, TDD and clean architecture. So feel free, you know, to connect with me or uh, follow me on LinkedIn for any of uh, these topics. Uh, the agenda uh, for today, uh, we will look at the motivation, you know, why are we here? Uh, why are we talking about this problem? And uh, we're talking about essentially the problem of the painful parts of TDD and looking at, you know, can we do TDD in some better way? We'll firstly start off with the deeper why so understanding that business needs is the driver behind software development uh, then we will look at how business needs translates into requirements and how tests are essentially executable requirements then we will zoom more into um, unit tests so basically looking at two perspectives on unit tests uh, one is a behavioral perspective the other one is structural so this is where we will review um, the classical tdd approach versus the mockest tdd and how does that relate to testing behavior and then we will zoom in you know further into history you know looking at kent beck but also looking at more uh for example practices at companies like Google regarding behavioral testing. And after we've covered all of these concepts, the difference between a behavioral unit test versus a structural, we will then also um, consider, okay, is there a difference if we write tests before code and after code and how can behavior you know, drive our development? And finally, we will uh, link all this together. So, you know, looking at both TDD and clean architecture. So how does behavior driven thinking um, drive us even at the architectural uh, level? So this is where we will synthesize, I mean, all the conclusions reached up to now. So first of all, uh, why are we here? And the reason why we're here is because TDD is painful. So many software development teams, when they first hear about TDD, you know, it's really promoted. It sounds like a great thing, but then software development teams try it and they just ex have a really painful experience with TDD and then they quit TDD. But the question is, uh, why, does, why does it happen and what, what are the problems that uh, cause these pains behind TDD? The first problem is a really common misconception, which is that the class is the unit of isolation. So many developers, if you ask them, you know, uh, how many tests, you know, will you write or what will you test? They will typically tell you, you know, for each production class, you write a test class and for each production method, you write test methods. 
That's the typical response. And that basically uh, that we're trying to isolate the class, which means we mock out all its collaborators because that's true isolation, right? Isn't it? Well, that's the perspective I mean held by many developers, even for me for, for many years. And even Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia states for unit testing that it's about testing individual units of source code. So it's about testing source code. And it says for object-oriented programming that it's about testing a class or individual methods. So basically, the really you know, common perspective that people have of tests this is what it is. And even if you Google on the internet, what is unit testing? These are the kind of answers uh, you will get. But during this presentation, you will later discover that this is actually not what unit tests was, was ever about. The second misconception that uh, many development teams have is that unit tests must be expensive. So we often think that it's normal for test code to be, you know, two to four times larger than production code, right? Because I mean, the more test code we have, it, might, it must mean that the program is high quality. That's a common belief. We also um, uh, accept the fact that unit tests uh, take up so much time. And then many people say, well, we don't have time for unit tests. We're under pressure. Uh, we also accept that unit tests break when we uh, refactor class designs. So if you, for example, add some method to a class or change methods, that it's normal for unit tests to break. So we've basically learned um, to live with the pain of TDD. Um, even though, again, all of these pains come from the fact that we're actually not doing TDD the way we were meant to. The last misconception that people have is that it's that BDD, so behavior-driven development, is about behavior, but TDD isn't, right? Because, I mean, there's a difference in the first word. So when you ask a developer what's ATD and BDD, they will say it's about you know, testing behavior, about testing the system from the user's perspective. But when you ask a developer what is a TDD, they will say that it's about testing classes, testing methods, and you know, testing interactions with other classes. And what happens often in companies is when uh, the developers are under pressure, you know, we have tight deadlines, the budget is tight. Then in the end, the only thing that remains is just these um, higher level tests, which are actually testing user requirements. And what happens with unit tests? Well, they are dropped because they are like optional. They're just a really high cost, nice to have. And again, this is a common misconception. Uh, about uh, unit testing. But here, imagine if we could solve the pains of TDD. Imagine if we could really do TDD in such a way that we actually speed up development. If we could do it with uh, significantly less test code. Imagine if tests wouldn't break all the time whilst you refactor. Imagine if you could do refactoring in a really uh, painful way. Imagine if you could test requirements at the unit level so that you don't have to wait for those slow running end to end tests to get feedback about requirements. But what if you could actually do it at the unit level? And imagine if anyone, you know, regardless of what's your budget or your deadlines, if you could um, get the, the benefits of TDD. So just to summarize, um, this is essentially the core uh, motivation behind this uh, presentation. Can we discover you know, the root causes? Why is TDD taking up so much time? Why is it so painful? And can we do it in a much uh, better way?
before we go into um, TDD, let's look at um, some bigger, like the why question. You know, why are we building houses? Well, to have a place to live. Why are we building cars? It's to travel. And why are we building software? To satisfy um, user needs. This is a key point. We're not getting paid to write co code. We're not coders. We're actually paid to solve business needs. And uh, making a software solution, like by converting business needs to requirements to software solution is just a mechanism to actually achieve that goal. So if we have a certain requirement, like for example, I want to travel from place A to place B, there are different solutions, you know, to satisfy that requirement, you know, going by, by a bicycle, car, or spaceship. And we can see here that uh, one requirement can be uh, satisfied by multiple solutions. So building software, it's just one of the solutions to actually um, satisfy certain requirement. Okay, so now that we've looked at requirements, let's see uh, what's the relationship between requirements and tests. So we will have a poll now. Um, so just want to check uh, how many uh, people in the audience are you familiar with the term uh, executable specifications? Uh, yes, no, uh, sort of. So the results bubble up. Currently about 50% says no, 30% sort of, and the rest, yes. And okay. we have already 180 responses from the 232 attendees. Yeah, so it stabilizes. So about 50% no. 30% sort of the rest, yes. Okay, uh, great uh, to, to hear that. So uh, we will now zoom into, you know, executable uh, specifications. It's executable specifications, essentially the word specifications is relating to, you know, requirements, what, what, what we need to uh, build and executable essentially means uh, that we uh, want to write those requirements in machine language versus uh, human language. So this is what we will be talking about in the following slides. So firstly, looking at the relationship between uh, requirements and implementation. We initially uh, start off with business needs. So business needs is the deeper uh, why. Right, I mean, we're developing some solution in response to business needs. Based on business needs, we need to come up with um, uh, software requirements. And these software requirements, they are converted into tests. And this is where the word, you know, executable specifications uh, comes in. And finally, uh, the software which we implement it's a response to you know satisfying the actual software requirements and this is where we said you know uh, we take re requirements we put them in executable way in the form of tests and then with tests we're driving the implementation so let, let's look at what that means if we have certain requirement specification we have one possible implementation maybe a second possible implementation third one and let's look at this relationship a bit more between requirements and implementation. So naturally, based on our requirements, we come up with an implementation. And when we change requirement specifications, then we naturally have to change the solution implementation too, right? I mean, that's just a uh, um, natural uh, link. But how about the reverse? 
are you allowed to change something in your software solution which just uh, breaks the requirements? Well, not really. So this means when we're doing uh, refactoring, so that means we're changing the implementation of our solution, we should not be changing the requirement specification because if we, change, if we don't satisfy the requirements, well, then we'll just get some bug reports from uh, QA or from users. Uh, now let's dig a bit deeper in this. If we say that our tests are essentially requirements of the system, then when we're building a system, our system can have some kind of API. Now here I'm not talking about uh, REST API, but API, for example, if you have a, a module and it's got uh, public um, certain methods or classes, then that's the, the public interface. And basically, in this case, uh, the, we're testing, our tests are just communicating with the API of the system and testing the external behavior. Because the external behavior of the system, that's actually what's required to uh, link to requirements of the system. Now, notice here that when our tests are linked only to the API, and have no knowledge of the implementation of the system, so the system implementation is a black box, then we can change the internal implementation and we're not going to break the tests. So we can do as much refactoring as we want and the tests will not break. But what happens if we say the tests are specifications of implementation and not requirements? In that case, our tests become uh, linked. So they are actually testing individual, you know, classes, methods, components, whatever, in the uh, actual solution implementation. And here you can see really high coupling. So here we can see that tests are coupled to the implementation, the internal structure. Notice here how many lines we have. What happens if we change some of these, you know, squares within implementation? We change an implementation class. Well, the test will break. So you can see here that this kind of testing leads to fragile tests. And when we summarize these differences, we will see why it's uh, superior if we, if our tests are focused on requirement specifications rather than implementation uh, specifications. So in case of requirement specifications, we're coupling to the API only, not to the implementation. Our tests are more robust. You know, we can refactor easily. The tests are stable when we refactor. There's no changes to tests when we refactor and we get a high return on investment. Now, if we write tests in such a way that tests are based on requirement specifications, we will get all of these benefits. But what's currently happening is that many development teams in the world are actually uh, testing, um, using tests as uh, executable implementation specification, and that's why we get you know, these bad results on the right-hand side. So uh, the rest of the... Um, presentation today will be focusing on this whole thing about testing tests as executable requirement specifications, as testing behavior. Okay, let's now zoom a bit more deeper into uh, unit testing and what exactly is a unit test. So here we have another poll. What's your familiarity with social versus solitary unit tests. So didn't hear about it, heard about it, but not clear and fully familiar with it. I mean, I know when I was uh, learning about TDD, it was several years until I discovered these words, but this was uh, an eye opener. So uh, we'll just wait for the poll. So I just launched the polls. First answer is here. 
Uh, right. Lots of answers coming in. Already wow. 100 of, out of the 230 people, 130 responses. So that's, that's very fast. Majority, 78% says A, or an option one, didn't hear about it, 78%. Then 13, 14% said, oh, I heard about it, but it's not clear. And only 9% say, say, I'm fully familiar with it. Okay, so excellent. Then this section will be uh, useful uh, for, for the audience because we will now, you know, go into these ones and I can assure you that once you understand this difference between social versus solitary unit tests, that's actually going to be the essence towards uh, being able to write really robust tests. Okay, before we go into that difference, let's look at, you know, what's a unit test in general. So unit test, it's about verifying a unit, right? It's in the word unit. Uh, verifying it in isolation and verifying it quickly. But here's the problem. Uh, what, what's the, act uh, the actual meaning of unit and what's the meaning of isolation? And this problem in terminology is actually the root problem. Why we have completely, uh, uh, why there's two completely separate streams of how we view uh, unit testing and TDD. So um, when we look at sociable unit tests, that comes from classical TDD approach and solitary unit tests from mockest TDD approach. Now, just for the audience, people like Kent Beck, Martin Fowler, Uncle Bob, they are from the classical TDD approach. So feel free to read uh, upon these approaches. In sociable unit tests, the unit is a module Again, no one really knows what a module is. I mean, how, how big is a module? A module can be, you know, one or more classes. So it's coarse grained approach towards viewing a unit. And solitary unit tests in that one, a unit is one class. So you're probably maybe, I mean, uh, people in the audience are maybe more familiar with, with this one of one class. Uh, the other dif difference is the isolation. So in sociable unit tests, we're isolating ourselves only from the external world. So the external world is like database, file system, external web services. But in solitary unit test, you're actually isolating your class from all its collaborators. So including other classes that you wrote. Okay, let, let's look at both of these ones in a bit more detail. So here we're starting off with a module. The module has some kind of API. So this is basically the public classes which are uh, uh, exposed by the module. In this case, it's A, that's the API. And our test here communicates only with the API of the module. Now this module inside, it's got other classes, B and C. So A, you know, to do its work, it delegates to B and C. But notice how the test has no idea that B and C exist. The only thing that the test is aware of is if we've got external dependencies, like if A needs to communicate with file system or database, then sure, uh, you know, in that case, we need to mock it out, you know, with a test double. And in that case, the test needs to be aware of that interface. So let's summarize what's happening here. So we see here that this unit test is accessing only the module API. Notice it's not accessing BNC. So module implementation detail BNC are not known to the test. This is really a crucial thing to, to understand. And test doubles, so this means, you know, like mocking, stub, fake, it's used only for the shared dependencies, so for D, so that we can run the test in memory. And here, what happens when we refactor? So let's say we change B and C, maybe we change some methods on it. 
what happens to the test? Well, nothing. There's no impact because the test has no knowledge of B and C. They are internal implementation details of the module. The test is only aware of the public API of the module. So just to summarize, with sociable unit tests, we're only testing the module API. We are not testing the module implementation. Uh, let's look at now at the different type of unit testing, so solitary unit tests, okay? So we have a module. Module has initially maybe one class, and we have a test for that, for that class. But this class A, depends on B and C. But what happens here is notice how this uh, test is probing into these classes which are in the module. And in the inside the test, if we test class A, but it depends on B and C, we have to mock out B and C. Maybe A also depends on you know the file system or database. So this also needs to be mocked out. Furthermore, since we're testing each class individually, we also need to come up with a unit test for B and C. Now, notice how, I mean, this diagram is already starting to look ugly. And the reason why it's looking ugly is because we are testing module implementation. So we're testing, you know, A, B, and C, which are inside the module, module implementation. The tests know exactly about each of the classes and all their collaborators. All the collaborators needs to be mocked. So when we test A, we need to mock out B and C. So there's a lot more mocking code. And then we get to the really bad part. What happens when we refactor? What happens if we change a method on B? Well, two things happen. The test for A breaks because it's dependent on the interface on B, and also the test for B breaks. And imagine if you had, you know, uh, even more classes, how bad could this get? So refactoring here is breaking tests. And this is something which you probably um, experienced. I mean, something which I had experienced for several years when I was using this approach. And this is what, what's fragile tests, essentially. It's a big problem that many uh, teams are experiencing. Uh, let, so when we compare these two diagrams side by side, we can see a big difference in coupling. So sociable unit testing here is low coupling, but solitary unit testing, notice like it's really high coupling. We've got so many lines, you know, all of these dependencies. Because in sociable, it's the test is testing only the API, so here uh, A and not B and C, whereas in solitary, each of these classes is tested individually. What happens if, we, if this becomes a bigger system? Here the coupling just becomes even more multiplied. So you can see here in sociable unit tests, we're testing the API only, so low coupling. Here with solitary unit tests on the right hand side, we're testing each of the classes in the module and we get really high coupling. And these are the tests which break when we refactor. Now, this was exactly the same topic which Uncle Bob uh, wrote about um, a, a few years ago, essentially the difference between coupling tests to API, which is lower coupling and the tests are easier to write, easier to maintain versus a uh, high coupling, whereby we get uh, all of these problems. Okay, uh, there's probably been a lot of new words in the past few slides, but let's try to summarize it. So sociable, and you can think of sociable as like, you know, a group of people all together. You know, it's like a group, you know, it's coarse grained. So it's a bigger unit. Uh, these kind of tests, they are testing uh, um, the module through its API. So they are focused on how the module 
behaves externally. But in solitary unit tests, the tests are going into the module, so they are aware of the classes inside the module implementation, and they are you know, testing module uh, structure. So they're targeting specific classes within the module itself. Now, in sociable unit tests, we get more uh, robust tests. So if we do refactoring inside, there's no impact on tests. Why? Because our tests are only uh, coupled to the module API and they're not coupled to the internals of the module. So we can do whatever we want inside the module. But what happens with solitary unit tests? So here, uh, when we're doing refactoring, basically, uh, you know, inside the module, a lot of tests will break. So we get the problem of fragile tests. And how does this translate to economics? So sociable unit tests, they are much uh, lower cost. You know, it's much less test code, the tests are more stable, then you get lower maintenance cost. Whereas solitary unit tests, they are uh, basically higher, much higher cost, you know, with more test code, uh, the tests are not stable. So when people say, my tests are constantly breaking, it's because they're doing solitary unit tests. When people say, um, it takes me too much time to write tests, uh, you know, it's too expensive to maintain, again, it's solitary unit tests. But when you do sociable unit tests, you know, you can refactor easily um, and you basically, you know, it's refactoring becomes really easy and safe and you don't have that much test code either. So it's a completely different scenario. Now, again, I know when I was firstly uh, learning about unit testing as, you know, as what happens to many developers, uh, we were using solitary unit tests and that's the really painful one. But sociable unit test is actually the one which, which provides you with, you know, this lower uh, cost. Okay, so with this, just, just to emphasize the key words here, but sociable unit tests, they are coupled to module API and they're testing module behavior. We will now zoom in a bit more about what this means, testing behavior, and when exactly, you know, and who even came up with the concept of, you know, testing behavior instead of testing structure. So here is another poll. Um, what are the origins of TDD, so test-driven development, and BDD, behavior-driven development? And we have three options. So TDD was originally about tests, and BDD was originally about behavior. Option two is both TDD and BDD were originally about behavior and option three is not really sure. So I uh, just start the polling. First answer is already here. Let's wait a couple of seconds. We have a little delay here with the streaming. Now uh, one of the responses already here. So the majority says uh, second option, both TDD and PDD were original about behavior, 55%. And the other two options are more or less the same, 23%, 24%. And uh, we have 180 responses. Wow, they, they came in really fast. Okay. Um, so we, we did have a, a mixed responses here. So the great thing is um, the answer is that both TDD and BDD were originally about behavior. And again, this is something which, which is generally not common uh, knowledge, but great that people here uh, were also aware of that as well. So let's look a bit more into history of this. Starting with Kent Beck, because He's essentially um, the person who uh, brought test-driven development to, uh, to, to the software development industry. 
he's basically saying that tests should be coupled to behavior. And here are some quotes. So programmer tests should be sensitive to behavior changes and insensitive to structure changes. So this means if we change behavior, yes, we want to change tests. But if we want to change structure, uh, if we change structure, we don't want to change tests. Another uh, great quote is that if the behavior is stable, uh, from an observer's perspective, so observer could mean, you know, a user or someone external to the system. If behavior is stable, no tests should change. And more explicitly, tests should be coupled to the behavior of the code and decoupled from the structure of code. So essentially what Ken Beck is repeating in all of these three quotes is that tests should be coupled to behavior. And if anyone reads um, the, his original book, so Test Driven Development by Example, and if you go, I think, approximately on pages one or two, he mentions the word behavior right then, you know, at the beginning of the book. So there's no mention of, you know, test classes or test methods. It's about testing behavior. And th that was the or origin of TDD. But the problem was um, not everyone recognized, you know, this uh, at the beginning. Uh, people, when they hear the word TDD, when they hear the word test, there's no word behavior in it. So for many people, it was not obvious. And what happened was uh, another person who you probably know, so Dan North, who coined uh, the word behavior driven development, he noticed that behavior is a more useful word than test and that requirements are behavior. What Dan was trying to um, basically do with this when he was uh, doing training or uh, for uh, development teams, he noticed that many people were confused by the word test in test-driven development and that they were asking, you know, what's a test? What are we testing? And then uh, in his uh, trainings, he would then use the word behavior instead of test to make it much more you know, apparent to people. So this means that the term BDD, when it was originally coined, it, he actually tried to fix uh, a naming problem within TDD. Now, of course, as everyone knows, I mean, over time, BDD evolved uh, and became associated with some additional concepts like ATDD, uh, Gherkin, Cucumber, and that's what many people associate with BDD now, but actually the origin of behavior-driven development was just fixing um, a confusing name, fixing the name test. Uh, let's look at what uh, Martin Fowler says about behavior. Uh, and structure. So basically refactoring is a way of restructuring an existing body of code whereby we change the internal structure, but we don't change external behavior. Uh, so from this, we can see that when we uh, refactor, we change structure, but not behavior. So if we're not changing behavior, then our tests should not be changed and our tests should not break. Okay, so now that we've heard a bit about uh, uh, history from Kent Beck, uh, Dan North and Martin Fowler about this whole topic of behavior versus structure, let's look at also some uh, more uh, recent sources and uh, application of TDD in, uh, I mean, unit testing in bigger companies, for example, Google. So they wrote uh, an excellent book about software engineering at Google. And one of the things they write about is striving for unchanging tests. And basically saying that when we're doing refactoring of a system, we should not be changing tests. And that only when we change behavior 
that that's the only case when we should change tests. And you can read about it a bit more in the book Software Engineering at Google, so lesson, uh, Lessons. Uh, it's really uh, an excellent uh, book, especially from a more practical perspective. The next statement that they make uh, is testing via public API. So basically, uh, it's about, okay, how do we write unchanging tests? Well, we write unchanging tests by testing the public API. But why, uh, why test the public API? Well, because then um, our tests are calling the system in the same way as a user would, you know, against the public API. Because when we think about it, Imagine if you go to, you know, an ATM and you want to withdraw cash. Can you like just open up the ATM and see what's inside? No, you can only interact with the ATM via its uh, public interface. So, you know, when you uh, put your pin in and when you choose a withdrawal amount, stuff like that. Well, that's you as a user. When we write tests, behavior-based tests, we should do it in exactly the same way. So through the public API. And this means in this way, the test is working in the same way as a, a systems user. So the test is essentially just another user of the system, which is interacting with the system through the public API and not knowing what's uh, inside um, the system. And again, uh, another, again, continuing on with this behavior topic, uh, the key principle is test behaviors, not methods. And in this way, we're taken back to our, I mean, the beginning of the presentation when we say, many people say unit testing, it's about testing classes and methods. Well, it's not, it's about testing behaviors. Now, it is true that many engineers, they initially try to match the structure of their test. So for every production method, you have a test method. But that's exactly the root cause of the problems. And this is uh, exactly the reason why uh, so many people are having a really, really bad time with unit tests. And here is what engineers at Google are saying, you know, don't write a test for each method, write a test for each behavior. So when we look at this sort of, I guess, all of these people, both uh, history, you know, when we're reading Ken Beck from, I mean, nearly, you know, 20 years ago, when we're looking at Dan North, when we're looking at uh, Martin Fowler, also if you read, I mean, Uncle Bob, and uh, when we read uh, these more recent materials at Google, they are all pointing towards one word, testing behavior. So let's see when we should write new tests. If there's a new behavior, yes, write a new test. But no existing test should break. If there's a change in behavior, then change your tests because the tests are testing behavior. So yes, they change when behavior changes. Both of these uh, kinds of, I mean, um, categories are uh, indicating behavioral changes. So this is where, you know, you've got new or changed business requirements. So this means a new user story basically, you know, comes in or maybe there's a bug found about behavior. But what happens if there's no change in behavior? What happens if I, uh, as a developer, um, look at my code and I see, wait a second, I don't really like the way I wrote this code. Maybe I could use factory pattern here or strategy pattern. Uh, maybe I could split my classes. You know, I want to improve my code. In that case, there should not be any changes in tests because when I'm refactoring, I should not be changing behavior. I mean, that's the definition of refactoring. So tests should not change. So just to summarize, in case of structural changes, where we're changing structure, like refactoring or redesign, but we're not changing behavior, then tests should not change. Uh, now that we've, uh, you know, 
um, discussed about you know unit tests and how to write more robust unit tests by essentially coupling to behavior. The next question is, do we write unit tests before we write code? Do we write it after? Is it maybe the same? Like, does it really matter? You know, why should we write unit tests before code? Should we? And this is where we have um, another poll for the audience. So did you uh, try TDD? And what was your experience with it? So option one is never tried TDD. Option two is tried TDD, but not really convinced, you know, didn't really adopt it further. Option three, three is tried and partially picked up TDD. So maybe continued it in some projects sometimes. And option four is, you know, the full 100% TDD that you tried TDD and that it changed your life and that now you're doing TDD and that you would not work uh, in a company with no TDD. You fully adopted it. Uh, you can't work in any other way. So looking forward to the results on, on this one. So the poll is running. So the first results are here, 100 results already. 50% uh, option three at the moment. More answers are coming in. 55% for option three. And it's now stabilizing. We have 100, 175 responses, 55% option three. Then the other ones about more or less the same, 14%, 17%, 16%. So fully adopted option four, only 16%. Never try TDD, only 14%. And try TDD, but not convinced, 17%. Yeah, so it's definitely uh, great Great to see these uh, results. So we can see, I mean, that most people here in the audience have tried TDD, but partially picked it up and didn't really fully adopt it. And this was actually also uh, my experience previously where, when I worked as a software developer. And part of the reason to explain why um, so many of us are in Option three is because of uh, these uh, pain points that we're actually, you know, experiencing, had experience with TDD, which was caused both due to, I mean, the previous issues that we discussed about unit tests, you know, when unit tests are uh, coupled to structure, but not behavior, you know, it uh, makes TDD a, lo a lot more uh, expensive. But the other reason, which I've also found why some people try it and only partially pick it up is because it's still not clear, you know, why you should write exactly tests before. It's just a lot more tempting to write the code first. So that's, uh, I found both of those from, from experience. So let's jump into TDD. So uh, in TDD, we have the red, green refactor cycle. We start off with the red. This is really important. You know, don't skip the red test because if you do, you can't prove that your code actually works. So start off with red, see the failing tests. This represents a falsifiable test. Then we go on to the green. So write just enough code to pass the test. We get working code and then we refactor. You know, we get to clean code. Now with TDD, we get the following feedback loops. So we find out, is our requirement testable? Can we write a test for the requirement? If we can't write a test for the requirement, it means the requirement is not clear. So we need to go back to the product owner or whoever, another person, and ask clarification for requirement. And in fact, even when you communicate with users, the easiest way is to ask someone, okay, give me an example, and you know, example service tests. The next feedback we get from TDD is falsifiability. Do we see the tests fail? Now, falsifiability actually comes from a scientific uh, uh, principle from hypothesis testing. Maybe you can read a bit more about it if you're interested, but 
seeing the test fail is essential because later when the test passes, you can be sure that your code um, is actually what caused the test to pass. If you skip this step and if you just go to green, then your uh, test may be giving you a false positive. So this is why you have to see the test fail. The test is also our first consumer of the code that we're writing. So it gives us um, feedback. Are we writing a user-friendly interface? TDD also gives us feedback about, you know, is our implementation correct? So that's the green step. And also is our implementation clean and uh, after we refactor it, does it still work? And that's the refactor step. Now, we also have one more poll. When does your team write unit tests? So option one is we don't write unit tests at all because my team doesn't want to. We don't write unit tests because we don't have budget or time for it. Option three is we firstly write code, then write the unit test after the code. And option four is we always write the unit test first, and then we write code after the test. So again, I'm excited to see what will be the responses on this one. Yeah, just started the polling. Now, a lot of answers coming in. 50, 70, 100 responses. So the trend is uh, option three. 77 percent 75 yes yes de definitely i mean uh, i would say you know the test last approach is still what's uh, dominant in companies you know people firstly write uh, the code and then okay we'll write the test afterwards or when we get to it so only five percent option one people who don't write unit tests at all then 8% for option two because of time and budget. And then 67% who write the tests afterwards. And the last option got 19%, which really okay. do clean TDD. Okay, first. so uh, from this, we conclude then um, that basically the majority. So uh, between 80 or 90% of participants are saying they are writing unit tests, but the majority within that are writing uh, unit tests last. And a big argument, which I've also seen you know, on LinkedIn is when people say, does it really matter you know, if you write your unit tests before or after? Well, let's now see, does it really matter? So in test-driven development, we start off with the requirement. We write a test based on the requirement and we see the test fail. So this red bar, by that point, we know, you know, is our requirement testable? Like, were we able to write the test? Is our test falsifiable? We make sure we see the red, that it's not green, that it's not a false positive. And we also get feedback for writing our test. Is our interface consumer friendly? After that, we're supposed to write a, a minimal, like really simple code. So this is where, you know, for, forget about design patterns, forget best practices, forget elegant code, just write anything that works. And that's the point of, you know, this uh, green step, write some basic code, however ugly it looks like, but just get it passing. And then the third step is, okay, we sit back, we look at our code, and then we see, hmm, I don't maybe like the fact that I've used if statements here. Maybe I could have used polymorphism. Maybe I could have used uh, the factory pattern, the strategy pattern, or something like that. And here, by having a test which already passes, you know, we can now focus on the design of our code and is it elegant, is it clean? And after we do some refactoring, we can anytime check, does the test still pass? Because our refactoring is not allowed to break the test. What we notice here in the lower part of this image is these uh, really short, uh, I mean, feedback loops. And this will be a huge difference in test TDD versus when we compare to test last development. 
so what happens is here we get really short feedback loops and this is why tdd helps us develop faster because when we get faster feedback loops if the system tells us that we're on the wrong path then we can do something about it and that's essentially the whole point so feedback loops uh, now we will go into the opposite so Tesla's development and let's look at the feedback loops there so in Tesla's development we start off with requirement we write some code we probably do manual debugging which is really slow and time consuming we write a test or maybe we never write the test and uh, what we discover here assuming we do write the test is that uh, our requirement is testable you know we were yes we were able to write a test and we figure out is our um, interface consumer friendly but notice here how these uh, feedback requirement and stability and interface consumer friendly we had to wait till like the third step to get the feedback but with tld when the test was at the start we got the feedback immediately okay so already these feedback loops are longer you know to get to, to these two compared to uh, tdd what if here we discover that we're not able we haven't been able to maybe write the test because our code is not testable maybe we discover that our interface is not user friendly and we discover it really late only here you know when we're writing the test well then we have to do the really you know um boring and time consuming rework of the test and code so maybe we discovered that our code was not testable you know we were not able to write test so then we have to rework both the test and the code and if we discover that our interface was not consumer friendly then we have to rework both the test and the code okay and finally when we're finished with all that we get a green that our implementation works notice here how we only get to the green there's no red but in this case, we don't know, is it green because our code truly works or is it green because our test is just giving us a false positive? So since we don't know, but we, let's say, want to get the same assurance as what we would get in TDD, well, then we have to comment out our source code and we have to see our test fail. And then when we uncomment our code, then we have to see that our test passes and then we say okay it's our code which made the test pass and finally we can uh, refactor uh, our solution so we can see here there's a lot more steps and the feedback loops are much longer and this is why with tld we get slower development so just to summarize even though sometimes it looks the same, like, does it really matter if we write the unit test before or after? Well, yes, it does. So even at the micro level, it, it really matters. And imagine if this is multiplied. So when we summarize this with TDD, we get shorter feedback loops, so we get faster development, and we uh, guarantee that code is covered by test. But with TLD, the problem is the much longer feedback loops, so if slower development, and we actually have no guarantee that code will be covered by tests. It will depend on the developer by developer, and in the worst case, the tests may never get written at all. Finally, we jump to the last part of our presentation, which is how does this whole discussion about unit testing, about TDD, and about it from a behavioral perspective, how does this link to clean architecture? So here is another poll for the audience. Uh, does your team use any of these architectures? So option one is the typical CRUD architecture. So this is where you have your you know, API controllers, the controllers delegate to some services, then you have entities uh, and repositories, and both entities and repositories are from your framework. So for example, you know, if you're using 
uh, spring, you know, hibernate, and then you have all of those annotations in there. Uh, so that's option one. Option two is hexagonal architecture. Option three is onion architecture. Option four is clean architecture. And option five is something else. So again, I would be interested to see uh, what kind of responses we will get here. So the last poll is running. The responses are coming. 50 responses. 80, 100 responses. So um, most do option one. 55, 54% option one. Then option two, hexagonal architecture, 14%. Onion architecture, 5%. Clean architecture, 11%. And something else, 16%. Interesting. And the numbers are stable, yeah. Okay, great to see that. So, yeah, uh, still the most common architecture is, uh, uh, as was voted here, the crowd style architecture. Now, for the remainder of this presentation, we will be talking about hexagonal architecture, onion architecture, and clean architecture because they have the same uh, essence. And we will discuss, you know, the whole benefits of these architectures with regard to testability. So hexagonal architecture, I remember when I first read about it, uh, at first it didn't really make sense. It was really foreign. You know, so we will um, look at it really bit by bit. We firstly start off with, you know, we have certain users who need to use our application, or maybe we have external programs or scripts who want to run our uh, application. Okay, so what do we do then? Well, we need to think up of some uh, application. But currently, we don't want to think about UI. You know, let's forget the UI. Let's forget the REST API. Let's forget the SOAP. You know, all of those are, you know, just presentation details. Uh, let's forget the, the database. We don't want to think about the database at the moment. Let's focus on what our application is actually uh, supposed to be doing, you know, the behavior of our application. This is where we need to think about use cases. So use cases could be, you know, create or the submit or the cancel or the or reserve uh, an airplane ticket or book a meeting. All of those are use cases. So use cases, it's about thinking what do our users want to do with our application. And these use cases, uh, they are called, I mean, driver ports in hexagonal architecture, user side API. Like that's what the users interact with. So if we have an example of, you know, ATM, when we're, you know, when we want to do press those buttons, you know, to deposit money or withdraw money, or when we want to reserve some tickets, you know, to travel somewhere, those, that's the user side API. After we've figured out the API, next thing we can think about is, okay, how are we going to actually, you know, implement it? How will these use cases get executed? So if it's a system for, you know, uh, e-commerce system, maybe here we will have, you know, orders inside system, products, uh, customers. We will have some logic about, you know, how do we calculate uh, order price? But we also discover that we need to communicate with the external world. Maybe we need for orders, we need to save our uh, orders. So we have, you know, an order repository interface. We don't know about what database we're going to use. We just know we'll need some persistence. We'll also maybe need to communicate with some kind of payment gateway, but we don't want to think about at the moment, is it going to be PayPal or, or something else? We don't care. But we have an interface, for example, for a pay payment gateway. And this in hexagonal architecture is the server side API. So it's essentially 
uh, when our application needs some other systems, you know, to do something. And it's also called driven ports. Then, okay, finally, we get to making the UI, the REST API or console application. It's, it's all here. Uh, they are basically called in uh, user side adapters. So we have user side API, which is boundary of application core. And then we have the user side adapters. So this is where, you know, you make your nice looking UI screens. Uh, maybe you make console application, mobile application. And guess what? Tests are here too. So tests are running your application in the same way as anything else. And finally, okay, we forgot the database. Well, we now come to, you know, database file, web services or payment gateways, and we need to write some adapter code, so server-side adapters, to communicate with those um, external systems. So to read a bit more about this, uh, I recommend Alistair Cockburn's uh, articles. And hexagonal architecture, the essence of it was a testable architecture because Alistair Cockburn wrote that he wants tests to be able to drive the application in the same way as users. So when we have our application core and we have this user side API, so that represents what the use case is needed by our users. We have the server side API, so those are like the repository interfaces, payment gateway interfaces. Then our tests, our unit tests, can execute use cases through the user side API. So we write unit tests, they are calling these um, ports, the use case ports on the user side API. Now we don't have real databases on the right hand side for the, you know, or the repository or payment gateway, but guess what? We can use test doubles. So if you've heard of fake smokes, stubs, those are test doubles, and they are a replacement for a real database. They are replacement for real file system. And the really amazing thing about hexagonal architecture is we're able to test use cases at unit level. You know, we don't need the UI. Uh, we don't need to wait for, you know, Selenium tests. We get immediate feedback about uh, how do we implement our use cases? Are they behaving correctly? Okay. So let's now jump onto the next architecture, Onion architecture. It might look different, but it has the same essence as hexagonal architecture, just with a bit more precise naming of layers. So let's look at uh, how it maps to hexagonal. Firstly, we start off with the users. Then we think about use cases and in Onion architecture, it's, you know, we have application services. It represents, uh, you know, uh, a way that our users can execute certain requests they want. Then we have the main models. This is where we have business logic. We've got the main services. This is where we have business logic, which maybe requires multiple entities. We also have repository interfaces or payment gateway interfaces. And notice there's no database here. There's no UI here. Okay. And finally, you know, yes, we have the user interface, the tests, and we have these technological uh, concerns. So databases, file systems, and we, the infrastructure code is what integrates, you know, with these external systems. Notice here again, how UI and tests, they are the same level. So tests, are essentially at the same level as users. And finally, we come to clean architecture, which was uh, proposed by Uncle Bob, essentially um, as a synthesis of all of these architectures, which came from hexagonal and afterwards. The key contribution, which I personally see from Uncle Bob is that he explicitly uses the word use cases, which was implicit in the previous ones, but here it's a bit more explicit. So let's look at how it maps to hexagonal architecture. We start off with the users. We identify what are the use cases that the users want to execute. Then we have to, uh, we want to implement some business logic inside the system. 
And maybe our system also needs to, again, have access to repository interfaces or payment gateway interfaces. And after we finish all, all that, then we can do the UI and tests. And again, notice the UI and the tests are basically sitting at the same level. They are, you know, tests are like the users. And finally, we have these technological concerns, you know, database file systems. And in uh, clean architecture, it's the implementation is called gateways. When we look at all of these three, they are all essentially equivalent. Um, so just that maybe the layers are uh, named sl slightly differently, but the essence behind all of them is we have the users, we have the application core, we expose an API to the users. We also have interfaces for anything we communicate externally, and that's pretty much it. We also realized that our tests are like the users. So we're actually testing from the user perspective. In fact, we're actually doing acceptance testing at the unit level. Now, isn't, isn't this really you know, great? So unit testing are executing use cases. And if we have any external you know, shared dependencies like databases, file system, we just replace them with, with test doubles. And this can be contrasted to typical end-to-end -end acceptance testing you know, through the UI. Now, what's the big benefit? When we do it at unit level, we can get really, really fast feedback. And since we're close to the end now, just to summarize all of this, with the test pyramid, most of our tests should be unit tests. And our tests are testing the system through its API. And if we need to uh, access any shared dependencies like databases file system, we'd use test doubles. When we do integration testing, then we want to test those shared dependencies. So when you write adapter for you know, your implementation for the repository or implementation for payment gateway, where you actually use the actual underlying technologies, here you test those adapters um, specifically. And finally, we've got you know, system or end-to-end -end testing whereby we test the connectivity of all of this together. But the amazing thing is that we can fully test all of the logic of our use cases, which is the essence of our system at the unit testing level. So to conclude this presentation, tests should be executable requirement specifications, not implementation specifications. Tests should be coupled to the API and not the implementation. They should be coupled to behavior, not to structure. Uh, clean architecture, it exposes use cases, and this means we can test application behavior at the unit level. We also learned that refactoring does not change behavior, so it would not, should not affect these kind of tests. And we've learned that these tests, which are testing behavior instead of testing structure, that behavior-based tests are much more robust and have much lower uh, test maintenance cost. So I want to say a big thank you to everyone um, for uh, your participation today, especially with the polls. Um, so just want to say thanks a lot. And you know, feel free to connect or connect with me or follow me on LinkedIn if you want to learn more about TDD and clean architecture. So I'm um, really looking forward to um, continued discussions and uh, questions about uh, the presentation today. Thank you very much, Valentina. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Very active chat, a lot of questions. Um, wow, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe uh, for the audience, uh, some questions were probably already answered uh, during the talk. Um, maybe you can delete them. Uh, and for all, for all other questions, uh, use the sum up to, to upvote uh, the ones that are most interested. So we'll start with... Uh, uh, let's switch back to the camera's view and then let's start with picking the first question. Alvaro, what's the first let's question? Go. 
So the first one is from Polkit that is asking, um, searchable unit test is seem more like integration tests, like we can do in three layer arch architecture of REST API. We only mock DB and external API uh, service calls. And it's basically a, an ask, is that correct? Is it a, a good understanding? Okay, excellent question. Like I, I really love, love this question regarding unit test versus integration test because the answer essentially depends on you know what's the school of thought. So sociable unit test, which comes from classical TDD approach for for that school of thought, and that's you know Ken Beck and Uncle Bob, it's a unit test. But if you read uh, books from a mockest TDD approach they would call this test an integration test because it's like multiple classes together. So basically, uh, uh, to, to respond to your question, uh, someone who's a classicist TDD would say sociable unit test is a unit test, but a person from Mocus TDD would say, no, it's an integration test. And this is a good point to be aware of, you know, when you're reading articles, books, or LinkedIn posts. Uh, I mean, this topic is uh, appearing so, so frequently. And the other part of this uh, uh, question is regarding the, like we do in free layer architecture, we only mock um, DB and external uh, API service calls. So it is true in sociable unit tests, uh, uh, you would have interface, you know, for repositories. So you would have like order repository interface, if you have external services like external payment gateway, you would have like a payment gateway interface. So that part uh, is right. Uh, it needs to be replaced by test doubles. But just one small correction, the word mocking. Um, in classical TDD, mocking is actually not used that much. I mean, it is used in mockest approach, but here it would be much more likely that a classic classicist TDD would use more like stubs or fakes instead of mocking. So that's, again, another thing which was beyond this uh, presentation. Um, but there's also one more difference uh, regarding the word uh, REST API. I just want to say here, when we're writing this um, unit test, there is no, no REST API uh, here anyway. Anyway, so it's the level below uh, the REST um, API. But yeah, you can actually think about it in that way. It's almost as if you're invoking your use case from the API layer, except not right at the top of the REST API layer, but a bit lower and mocking out any, any uh, externals. So um, excellent question. Next question is from Jema Klaas. I don't know how to pronounce the name, sorry. What is the best way to start introducing TDD in a team with poor or almost null testing experience? Okay, um, this is an excellent one. Uh, the first thing which, which I've done is firstly getting people to think about um, test first. So uh, the whole Test-driven approach doesn't mean necessarily writing unit tests. It simply means you have to think of the tests first. So it means when you sit down with a developer, you ask them, okay, uh, before you develop the system, you ask them at the beginning, how will we test this at the end? And you'll firstly get the response, wait a second, why are you asking me now? Like, how are we going to test that we didn't even make it? But then you ask them, okay, let's try to think from the user. You know, if we're testing an order, what are some sample, you know, if we choose free products and it has certain price, what should be the calculated price? You know, what should be, you know, ask them for their expectations. So that's the first way that you can get someone to shift their thinking and ask the people, you know, write it on paper, write it on a blackboard. What are the expectations? Once people get adjusted to thinking about tests first, then you say, okay, now, instead of writing it on paper, these, you know, examples and these assertions, let's write it in code. So then you switch from paper, you switch from code and you have the test and you read out the test and you ask the whole group, okay, does this test match to what's expected in our user story? And people might say, yes, it does. Okay, great. We can then go on to code. Or if someone says, no, I disagree. 
it should not happen. You know, that's the wrong, wrong response. Okay, let's correct the test first. And then we go uh, on to the code. So I would say the biggest issue is that developers see testing as some kind of secondary activity, as something which is inferior, you know, as less worthy of code. So you have to actually switch them to think about tests first and to recognize that tests are equally important, though I'll actually say even more important. But okay, don't tell them that at, at the start, but just say e as equally important. So it's uh, make them think of, um, instead of using the word test, say we are uh, writing this specification, moving it from paper, we're moving it into code. So just call it, we're writing specifications inside our program because we want to fulfill our specifications. Again, really uh, excellent question, a big challenge. We have a, a next question from Ayub that is in the same uh, line. Um, what is the proposed solution when a project never used TDD or BDD and it's quite old and the code base is very large? Okay, um, these are actually the kind of projects that uh, I'm working on uh, in coaching because most projects are legacy projects. It's, it's very rare for a developer to work on a greenfield. So uh, with a legacy project, um, and the team has never done TDD uh, before, it does require, first of all, acceptance from management level that for the next period, for the team to transition to TDD, to pick a certain part of the code, uh, an important part of the code, and to start writing uh, tests for it. Now, yes, it does mean that there's going to be a drop in productivity because the team is uh, learning TDD, but it has to start somewhere. So basically, you start off with, um, I would suggest, for practice, an isolated part of the system, something which is maybe not production critical, for your practice. And then uh, once the uh, team learns about TDD and get, gets a bit more familiar with writing uh, unit tests, then you can actually transfer uh, to refactoring bit by bit other parts of the system. But since management will never allow you, you know, to have like a obviously refactoring or TDD sprint, you can use your, your new user stories. So when you have new user stories and tests, and if you're touching existing parts of code, write some tests for those first before you implement your change or before you write your um, bug. Um, but uh, it can be painful and it does require acceptance from the team and from uh, the company simply due to there will be an upfront slowdown, but later you, you get, you get the benefits. So I would say to management communicating, you know, if we don't introduce tests, our features uh, delivery is really slowed down. So we have to actually introduce tests. Thank you. Next question from Christian, quite a long one. I'll read it, uh, whatever you call it, it is on a higher level in the testing pyramid. Mm -hmm. The thing is, the thing is heavily it it heavily depends on the complexity of the unit which are behind the public interface. A, if they are complex, you want to test them in isolation, and not only if you have assembled everything. B, if you need to test corner cases, is it is getting harder and harder the more layers are between your test and the if in the code contain and the code container the special case. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, this is another excellent question. And this is actually the source of disagreement between the classical TDD proponents versus the mockers TDD uh, proponents. Because the key benefit of classical uh, TDD is basically, you know, your tests are testing behavior and, you know, um, your programming, you want to test the API only, not the implementation and refactoring will be much easier. But here you don't have the granularity. So if you want to access specific classes, it's not done in classical TDD. 
but in mocus TDD, and those are the solitary, solitary uh, classes in that one, you have that kind of uh, granularity. So there are certain applications, maybe if you're doing um, a mathematically complex, uh, that's one example which I've encountered, mathematically complex applications or something like cryptography, something where the implementation, where it's just so complex, you've got certain parts which are really complex. In that case, uh, you can actually drop down to that level. Now, uh, with Mocus TDD, you would only drop down to the specifically class level. Now, with classical TDD, uh, your module can be as big as you want it. So in the hexagonal architecture we showed, uh, you're testing the whole use case, I mean, fully. But if you find that there's something which is maybe too complex, you're not able to even write maybe the test for the use case, you want to drill down, then again, you can take a set of classes within, so the module can be within the, the system and then do the test uh, in it. But since you're then coupling, you know, to specific classes in implementation, then yes, you will have later the cost in refactoring. So just to summarize, if you do have some kind of complexity like mathematical complexity, then okay, in that case, uh, uh, that's one of the cases where you do want to drop down to this, you know, smaller scale um, testing. Now, the other question in terms of testing corner cases, um, well, if the user can specify the various, I mean, corner cases, like uh, did I input, I don't know, zero products, or a hundred products, those ones you can test it, you know, from the uh, higher level, there, there, there's no issues. So I'm not yet able to think up of what it means here regarding the test corner cases. So maybe there can be clarification um, for, for, for this one. Yeah, maybe we can discuss this later in person. Yes. Yes. Let's pick a, another couple of questions and then we move on to the wonder.me room so we can talk face to face. Let's do that. Then we have a question just after that that is about uh, naming. Um, basically, it's Rohan that is asking aren't sociable unit tests actually component tests, sometimes called integration tests? I understand component testing to be a higher level of testing than unit, than unit testing. Uh, yes, so this was similar to the first question which was asked, which is essentially the difference between classes as TDD and mock as TDD. So classes as TDD, it's a unit test, but mock as TDD person, they would say, no, this, this is actually an integration test or a component test. That's a difficult topic. Huh? We have different worlds to talk about the same thing. Out uh, of confusion. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the biggest confusion. So even on the internet, when you uh, read a one about unit test and integration test, you will fully get these contradicting definitions just due to the different schools of thought. Then there's an interesting question from Silvan, uh, who says, uh, Nat Price, um, Mokis, London School TTD, uh, once said that it's not A versus B but more of knowing about both approaches and combine them. What are your thoughts about that? Just, just having talked more about the pro-classicist approach. Okay, excellent question. So first of all, I was working with the Mocus approach for many, many years. And in fact, most developers, I think, are working in that approach and that's the one which appears on Wikipedia and all, all internet articles. It was only later that I ended up uh, using the classical TDD approach. Now, for me, uh, it depended on um, the type of project. For most projects, like business enterprise projects, I go with uh, classical TDD simply because um, the focus there is, you know, there's business logic, there's not that much mathematics, not, not that much, I mean, uh, complexity in that kind of way. It's more about you know the use cases, so I find that the classical really fit there. But the mockest one, I found it useful for, for example, really 
algorithmically mathematically complex complex uh, applications maybe you need you have some matrices and you have to compute the certain things on matrices and then it's too much to test it all in one you can't uh, you don't even know the results so then you test it you know operation by operation so th that's that's one example where i see you know a place for both so just to summarize for most applications classical tdd would be my recommendation but it's just a short answer long answer we can discuss after but for more uh, algorithmical mathematical financial maybe you need mockest but uh yes you can also combine both of these in one project so you can have both the sociable uh you know unit tests for the use cases and maybe for some really hard part of your application where you want to go down deeper you can have solitary unit tests, so you can combine it. I would recommend for all developers to know both approaches and to try both approaches and that you can see and feel the difference in the benefits of refactoring, which is the classical TDD benefit versus the benefit of granularity, which is more, but maybe we can discuss it afterwards. That's a big uh, topic. Thank you. Uh, Do we go for another one? Yeah, Valentina, how are you? One or two more questions or? <laughs> yes, yes. We're still, okay, you're still, still fit. Alive. She's still on, fire. <laughs> on fire. On <laughs> fire. This is my favorite, uh, favorite topic. <laughs> Very well. Then we have a question from Kai Hue, sorry for the pronunciation, uh, that asks, uh, how would you test a set of 100 validation rules running over a business object and producing validation errors and warnings? Okay, that's another good one. So first of all, the word business object, I assume it's referring to like domain entity, like, or the bank account, okay? Now we've, um, social unit tests so the classical tdd approach we actually don't know about the business objects we only care about the use case so what's your use case is it maybe to deposit funds or withdraw funds or make an order or whatever is the use case so at the use case level you know when you're doing the requirements you have some kind of um uh, validations at the use case level uh now if you have um a hundred of them maybe the question is will you write a hundred tests uh or uh, depending on uh, um the actual la language and technology you, you could have a different uh notation whereby you write one test and that test is saying okay there's an input and i expect a validation error and then you supply that test with a table above above the test and then in that table, you actually write all the invalid uh, combinations. So that, that's the more I uh, recommend the approach. Okay, then from Abdelkrim, who writes, uh, I find it difficult to apply TTD and clean architecture in client-side applic client applications like single page applications or native desktop applications, since the use cases are highly coupled with the UI. E.g., if you move a part of the UI to a different screen, the use case would change. Could you please elab elaborate on this subject? Okay, so use cases, they should be uh, independent of the UI. And in fact, even um, when business analyst writes use cases, they should not mention any UI details. So just to give, give an example, if we're making um, uh, an application for withdrawing funds, the use case could be, you know, that I need to input the amount that I need to withdraw and that when the system, you know, uh, executes the withdrawal uh, operation, then I get my updated balance. Now here we did not say the word, we have no idea where the text box is. And maybe it's not a text box, maybe it's another control where you, you know, enter uh, data. So this means uh, for that kind of testing, um, you're not testing um, like the actual necessarily uh, control, but you're testing that logic below uh, the control itself. Uh, I can see this question coming up a lot from a front end because I find 
in front-end uh, unit tests are much less uh, understood. So maybe this could be another uh, question which we could continue in the next session. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I'll pick a last question and then we move on to the Wonder Me room. So because there's also two terms uh, which sometimes pop up. Is it called London versus Chicago TDD as well? Uh, yes, it is. And in fact, when I wrote a, um, a LinkedIn post, I did it, you know, uh, Chicago versus London TDD. And then people were repli replying, okay, we're from Chicago, like Chicago wins again. And then some people from London also got, got uh, upset. So uh, in summary, they are both equivalent terms. So Chicago TDD means uh, classical or classicist TDD. London means mockest. Uh, additional words are also outside in and inside out. So we've got three variants of words that can be used for both of these. Excellent. Thank you for answering that. So we move over to the Wonder Me room. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Still 135 people here in the <laughs> webinar. A lot of people. Um, and uh, you will be automatically redirected as soon as uh, the Big Marker webinar ends and we will see each other in the Wonder Meetup room. Bye bye, everyone. See you soon. Bye.